It's Monday, June 11th, 2012. I'm Alex Jones, and this is yet another original, groundbreaking edition of InfoWars Nightly News. Tonight, Navy SEAL Chris Kyle claims in his autobiography and on national television that he once punched Jesse Ventura in a bar for insulting a fallen U.S. soldier. But multiple witnesses, along with several prominent Navy SEALs, affirm the incident never happened. And now the lawsuit against Chris Kyle over the bogus story moves to U.S. District Court. And speaking of bogus stories, another TSA study claims irradiating body scanners are safe, despite cancer warnings from experts and no independent testing allowed. Then, a major escalation in the battle over Fast and Furious, as the House of Representatives moves forward with proceedings to hold Attorney General Eric Holder in contempt. Plus, John Rappaport from No More Fake News joins Alex via video Skype. If I were Ron Paul is, like I said before, I would do a mea culpa. I would say, I'm wrong. I was wrong, I am wrong, and I'm gonna fix it. That's up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. <laughs> Again, thank you for joining us tonight. We've got a huge transmission lined up for you. InfoWars own Patrick Henningsen is going to interview William F. Ingdahl at the Financial Terrorism Conference in London, and then John Rappaport on the polls going mainstream. Mainstream Republicans, the big backlash to that. We're going to be breaking it down in detail. But first off, you love him, you hate him. There's no doubt he is a maverick. The book is out today. We're interviewing him tomorrow. Jesse Ventura, Democrips and Republicans, And it says, no more gangs and government. The system knows that Jesse Ventura cannot be bought. That's why News Corp, through their publisher, put out a book early this year saying that Jesse Ventura said that he's glad U.S. troops are dying. I know him personally, something he'd never say. And in fact, he says he hates the wars because our troops get killed in them. And that a Navy SEAL, Mr. Kyle, punched him out. Well, Ventura filed suit a few months ago and actually uh, faced the guy in court. And the lawsuit is going ahead. Uh, they were in court uh, on June 4th last week. Jesse Ventura will give us details next week. But um, Kyle's in a lot of trouble, according to Ventura, because... He's got the owner of the bar, Ventura does. He also has uh, his former Navy SEAL trainer who lives in the area. They all checked into it, found out it was not true, according to the owner of the bar and others. Yeah, no kidding. It'd be big news if Jesse Ventura got, got punched out. And this was all a big lie, according to them, to sell books. Gee, it's coming out of Rupert Murdoch, you know, breaking this news and publishing the book. Uh, and so it's all going to go to court now. I mean, they've already gone to court, but now it's going forward and Jesse Ventura has his witnesses. When I first called Ventura with this, he just got into Mexico when they announced it. He said, Alex, you know, you're joking. Come on, don't sit here and play games. And I said, look, have I ever called you joking? This is the type of garbage we're talking about. And then Ventura said, my God, was somebody look like me? This is bizarre. This is the type of dirty tricks the system engages in against mavericks like Jesse Ventura. His new book is out. It supports the broadcast if you purchase it. It's available at InfoWars.com, along with ProPure Discounted, the Life Straw, and other uh, key preparedness items at InfoWars.com. And again, your support of the transmission makes it all possible. I've been so busy covering Bilderberg and uh, doing all this, I haven't even been plugging all the books, videos, T-shirts, products we sell that fund this operation. Also, one PrisonPlanet.tv membership is $5.95 a month. And uh, it's six memberships. Six people can log on with the same username and passcode. And that enables us to get out and tell you the truth about what's happening in this country and worldwide. So try out the free 15-day free trial at prisonplanet.tv. All right, shifting gears into more of the news. Kyle claimed that he met Ventura in a bar in um, Southern California in Coronado in 06 while Ventura was in town to speak to a new class of SEAL graduates at nearby Naval Amphibious Base Coronado, which he was not there to speak to them. Also present were family members 
holding a wake for Michael Mansur, one of the first Navy SEALs killed in Iraq. Kyle claims Ventura became loudly objective to the war in Iraq before calling troops murderers and saying we deserve to lose a few guys. Kyle then claims he punched Ventura, knocking him to the floor, and quickly ran away. Do you believe any of this? The Navy SEALs, owners of the bar, others checked this story. Did not happen, according to them, and Ventura has those witnesses. One of the former SEALs is Ventura's former instructor, the widely respected Terry Mother Moy, the ex-SEAL who owns the bar where the incident is alleged to have occurred, is also backing Ventura. Ventura wasn't going to sue at first, but then he was, quote, ordered by his former superiors to do it because they're tired of Navy SEALs cashing in with Hollywood and to sell books telling lies, according to them. So, Kyle, boy, I warned you on the radio when we talked to you on the time when I was on the Open Anthony show, you better watch your butt. And the publishers of this better watch your butt because Ventura is coming after you. Okay, let's continue here, shifting gears to the big controversy. Look, I like Rand Paul. He's a good guy. I, mean, I talked to him like 10 years ago. I said, hey, you can get Rand Paul on. He'll do interviews for his dad running for Congress. Let's see you know, if the apple falls far from the tree, and it didn't. I encourage him to run. I'm very, very sad and disheartened by this, but the liberty movement moves on. I understand he's part of the Republican Party. What are you going to do? Uh, Mitt Romney, but you know, your dad didn't endorse McCain four years ago because he understood that he was bought and paid for by the same interest. And we've gone over the flip-flopping of Romney. I mean, you got to see it to believe it. It is absolutely incredible. We have a video up at Infowars.com titled Mitt Romney, the King of Flip-Floppers, if you want to see it. I mean, it's amazing what these guys do. And, and, and look, I said Ron Paul on Friday, Rand Paul, because they, they coordinated their announcement announcements about, well, we won't win the delegates now, you know, and by the way, uh, you know, Mitt Romney's a great guy. I said, hey, come out and explain yourself at least. Don't do it on Sean Hannity. Tell us why you did this. Well, they had uh, one of the campaign guys, Jack Hunter, come out. I'm going to read these quotes later when our guest is on with us. And he said, hey, the Republicans won't like us if we don't do this. Well, hell, get behind torture. Get behind NDAA. Get behind secret arrest. Get behind the UN commanding our military. Get behind all the illegal wars. Get behind the whole thing uh, if that's what you think. I mean, because all the others say the same thing. Hell, I should have voted for Newt Gingrich if that's the case. Or, or maybe, uh, you know, I mean, any of these other guys. It's mind-blowing to see this uh, twisted political response to it. And, and again, I still love Ron Paul and like Rand Paul. It's just that now, no more honeymoon. You know, you go, well, I'm voting for uh, sanctions, even though it's not an act of war. Sanctions are an act of war in Iran. Your dad said those are acts of war. I mean, Rand, what's the point of getting elected president down the road like you guys are saying you're doing this for if you're a globalist? You are losing your luster. That's what's happening here, and it's, it's a sad thing. It's, it's, it, it, I feel like it's a betrayal. My gut, and your gut is just the synthesis of all the data, feels totally betrayed. And, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe you're going to show us. So we hope that's the case. But regardless, the fact that Ron Paul went so far, really won the first primaries, had to be cheated, shows that Liberty is incredibly, incredibly popular. Just because the Bilderberg Group wants to co-op libertarianism so they can control it, doesn't matter. That, those ideals of freedom are absolutely imperative. Hey, he's supporting legalization of raw milk. And, and, and hemp and, 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 and things like that so the police state doesn't have excuses to bust down our doors. I'm going to still support Rand because he's much better than most of them. It's just that what we're seeing is a big bummer. People are like, hey, get mad at the New World Order, I'm, I'm a minority of listeners and viewers. I am more mad at them. It's just that these were our guys. And so we're telling them we're unhappy. I mean, that is our right as citizens in the First Amendment. I mean, we did give them our money and our time and energy. Is it, is it sacrilege to... Uh, I mean, to not want to bow down and lick the feet of Mitt Romney, a known con artist liar. Okay. Let's shift to some other criminals uh, here in the New World Order, the real threats. House committee schedules contempt vote against Holder. We've played the news conferences before he even got busted saying they were running guns to track him. And then he says he's, he knows nothing about it when the full scope came out. I mean, he's been caught lying. Show has... Uh, Mr. or whatever its name is, the, the crazy from outer space. 
Janet Napolitano. We've got some key video of her coming up, by the way. You don't want to miss that. Uh, now Holder, uh, you know, is, is, is uh, on the defensive. But again, if they actually try to impeach these people and actually go after them, then I might start supporting a little bit the Republican Party. But they can't because, as Holder said six months ago, Bush was involved in Fast and Furious type programs as well. So this is only being brought out now to score political points. Here's another report. Again, House moving to hold Holder in contempt. That's how the Washington Times, the article I just showed you, was out of CBS News. But they've been caught engaged in massive in-your-face insider trading uh, in the Congress. And so don't hold your breath on them actually taking action against these people because they are so compromised themselves. And that's the problem with the corruption of society. Once you get a bunch of crooks and semi-crooks in government, none of them can go after the really bad offenders because they've got skeletons in their closet as well. And that's when civilizations really go downhill and finally collapse. An Ethan A. Huff article at Infowars.com uh, reports Gattaca becomes reality as scientists screen abort human babies based on 3,500 genetic faults. And by the way, aggression, competitiveness, they say that's a fault. And of course, a lot of children that end up having a predisposed sign that they may develop a disease, well, a lot of those diseases are being kicked on by chemicals and by GMOs in the society. You know, they want to ban soft drinks above 16 ounces in New York, the total nanny state, but let you drink aspartame and eat GMO. This is so incredibly dangerous, these designer children. And a lot of times if you have a health problem or another issue, genetically it's been found that you'll have other traits that are Einsteinian or or you know connected to things like Tesla. Tesla was kind of an idiot savant and had weird 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 behaviors and, and, and health issues. Again, we have a lot of gifts and a lot of minuses. And a lot of times if you have minuses in your genetics, you also those are the valleys compared to the mountain peaks. I mean a lot of parents are now genetically aborting babies off genetic testing. Uh, or separately screening embryos for looks. Well, just because they can project that this child's going to look like a supermodel and you throw away the other 10 eggs and sperm that create the zygote, maybe that girl is not going to have the incredible maternal instincts to be a good mother or a mathematician or a pianist. Again, this is so dangerous. This is so out of control. We have a special report later in the week coming up on that, but you got to read this article. Gattaca becomes reality a scientist screen aboard human babies based on 3,500 genetic uh, faults. And again, the globalists are trying to wreck our DNA with GMO right now very effectively. Okay, moving on to something wrecking our genetics. That's cell phones, microwaves, the scanners. They've been caught where they've had them in for almost nine years at Boston Logan with a seven-fold increase last year, uh, in the last few years, of cancers there in a cover-up. And they lie to people and say, oh, we've done radiation testing. Oh, John Hopkins says it's safe. And then the media goes to John Hopkins and they go, actually, our study says it causes cancer. Uh, yeah, if something can see the bones in your face, it's shooting particles in there and then reading them when they bounce back on you. Okay, and yes, we're in a radiation-rich environment next to a big sun. We are bombarded by it. We get sunburns by it. But you're only supposed to get so much of it in your life. That's what kills us. That's what makes our DNA break down is the radiation system we're in. I'm getting it from these televisions and lights around me. But nothing compared to these. These lights aren't shooting in you know, and showing the bones in my fingers. They're barely lighting up my face. Can you, um, and, and, and that's in that narrow spectrum of light. Can you, and my skin's designed to take that and turn it into vitamin A. But you go the other route, it's very, very dangerous. Another bogus study claims irradiation by TSA body scanners are safe. They also claim irradiating food safe. Still no independent testing despite cancer warnings from experts. Yeah, they keep lying to Congress for like four years saying, oh, it's, it's safe, it's safe. However, even LA Times report itself admits that analysts will likely not uh, allay Concerns because, once again, no independent testing of the body scanners is undertaken. As the report notes, uh, Schmidt did not test the actual machines. Instead, she based her conclusions on scanner radiation data released publicly by the TSA. 
And if she's the same Schmidt lady I saw, she's being paid by the company that's developing these. I saw that last week. <laughs> and let's, in fact, is that article? I didn't read the whole article. Does it break down that, uh, that a bunch of these experts promoting them actually work for these companies or have contracts? Uh, just amazing. Indeed, even John Hopkins scientists have warned that TSA body scanners will lead to an increase in cancers. But now they say, hey, it's safe for the troops to use DU with no contamination, uh, decontamination uh, procedures. They're saying Fukushima's no big deal. This stuff is all in your face. Put that full screen back up there because this article is important. They've told Congress that they won't let them see the actual screening documents. They've told them this. They've lied to us and said, John Hopkins su you know, supports them and says there's no radiation. And then John Hopkins' own scientists come out and say, actually, their reports say the opposite. This is a group of congenital liars. Just last week they said, well, on Friday we covered it, that they're allowed to lie to the American people and lie to Congress. This is a rogue group where they're hiring pedophiles to be the head TSA people in almost every major city because only they want to sit there and grope little children and women and old people. Incredible. Now, speaking of that, uh, we want to talk about Janet Napolitano now. Janet Napolitano uh, has, has accelerated the police state massively, and she's agreed to come on the show tonight. Janet, come on, please. There she is, uh, showing her true form. Oh, wait, a TSA bat boy. I'm told that's what she's about to give birth to. Yep. Oh, what? You got to be kidding me. Did you see that? <laughs> Guys, can we have an instant replay of that? That is incredible. Can we have her back on the show? What an incredible human being she is. Oh, come on. Oh, yeah. She's very proud of her. Oh, here they come. Highway checkpoints. I mean, these people are cancer. I didn't know she was actually the star playing the alien from the 1984 John Carpenter film, The Thing, but there you go. Okay, we're going to go to this William F. Ingdahl interview with Patrick Henningsen from the big conference they had last week. We're going to be doling these out all week. Max Kaiser, you name it. We showed you a compilation last Friday, a few snippets of the people he interviewed. But uh, uh, here is William F. Ingdahl coming up after the Daily Quote. A government for protecting business only is but a carcass and soon falls by its own corruption and decay. Amos Branson Alcott. And that was back in 1799. Well, he was born in 1799 and lived through 1888, was an American teacher, writer, philosopher, and reformer. Well, what about government for big corporations to shut down your competition? That's the real threat. Okay, here's the William F. Ingdahl interview from the Financial Terrorism Conference. Then we're going to go to break in teleprompter free news and come back with John Rappaport with an in-depth interview on what this means the liberty movement, Rand Paul, he only endorsed Dark Sidious because Dark Sidious said he wouldn't like him uh, if he didn't endorse him. So I, I think it's reasonable. So we're going to be talking about that coming up with John Rappaport as well, another jam-packed original transmission of InfoWars Nightly News. Don't forget, 15-day free trial, PrisonPlanet.tv, to see this when it first airs and nine years of material at PrisonPlanet. Dot TV. So here's the financial terrorism conference interview with William F. Ingdahl. Have interviews all week long. The great work of Patrick Henningsen. And then we'll go to break, come back with John Rappaport. Stay with us. I'm F. William Engdahl. I'm an author, a lecturer on geopolitics. Uh, I've published books on the subject in 11 foreign languages from China to Korea to Germany to Russia to France and uh, beyond. English, of course. And uh, I, I'm based, I live here in Europe, I have been for some years. And basically what I do with my books uh, is try to shed light on various dark corners so that ordinary people will get an idea of what's being done to us uh, and, and uh, act accordingly to, depending on their information. And uh, what, tell us about your, um, your, your speech today, which I saw, in relation to the theme, financial terrorism, and how, how you felt, why you felt it's important to be here. Okay. Well, I 
was asked to speak uh, on this tour. It actually started in Dublin a week ago, and uh, yesterday we were in Manchester in Northern England, and today in London at the coincidental time of the Queen's Jubilee, which is a rather bizarre clown show. And uh, the theme of the con conference or the series is financial terrorism, and, and my message, I uh, talk about this in my book, The Gods of Money, Wall Street, and the Death of the American Century, not, not the American dollar, but the American century as a system, is that there is no such thing as capitalism as a closed economic system like feudalism and so, but what we're in, and we've been in for uh, nigh on to 5,000 years now if you want to count it that way, is a system of hidden debt slavery that certain powerful uh, elites uh, have set up. They, they had run it out of Venice uh, hundreds of years ago, then uh, the power of Venice collapsed and they moved the headquarters of this debt slavery to uh, the city of Amsterdam. That collapsed in the uh, 1790s and it moved to the Bank of England and the city of London. After World War II in uh, 1944 it moved to Wall Street and the gods of money in Wall Street. So what I went through is the, the different phases of this crisis building up in the period since Bretton Woods, 1944, uh, in my own lifetime, and to give people an idea, there is no out. We're not in a recession. I've said this on uh, Alex Jones's program, I think about four years ago, that this is not an ordinary recession. It's the early phase of a global depression that is going to make the 1930s look mild by comparison, uh, depending on what ordinary, we ordinary citizens do about it. So we are in the beginning of a massive uh, debt collapse and, and uh, of course the, uh, the masters of money, the gods of money, want to steer that collapse to their advantage so they get private debt of fraudulent criminal banks like, like Allied Irish and other banks, uh, most of the big ones, too big to fail so-called, and they, they put the burdens of their crimes on the public taxpayer who were innocent to begin with and had uh, no responsibility for these crimes. And so Greek taxpayers, Irish taxpayers, Spanish taxpayers are now coughing up the money through their own pensions, through their own wages that are being slashed uh, dramatically and uh, that's the whole austerity theme that uh, that has been uh, ravaging Europe for the last uh, uh, several years and it's it's not going to get better these bailouts uh, smart money knows that these bailouts are a fraud so uh, they're all preparing to short all these markets and make a huge killing on that well, what what was launched in uh, in the what well, began in Tunisia with the so-called Arab Spring was a rolling destabilization uh, engineered by the Pentagon, engineered by the National Endowment for Democracy, a U.S. government financed NGO that does today what the CIA used to do 25, 35 years ago, uh, namely regime change to a more Wall Street friendly uh, order. And what they're trying to do is create what they did with the collapse of the Soviet Union 20 years ago, namely force these countries under the IMF thumb create chaos, create disinvestment in order to br bring control of the vast oil wealth of these countries, the enormous resources and, and uh, uh, savings of these, these uh, monarchies and, and uh, countries under the control of the Wall Street gods of money, Wall Street, the city of London, it, it doesn't matter much, the distinction. And uh, not only that, but to create this chaos and instability geopolitically because of the emergence of a new economic center of gravity, geopolitical center of gravity, and that's called Eurasia. Eurasia goes uh, from really from Western Europe, from the Atlantic to the uh, Pacific, Vladivostok in uh, the easternmost part of, of Russia, but it includes China and Russia most especially. And to the extent that Brazil and South Africa uh, try to coordinate with that, join in with that, uh, make their trades not in dollars as an intermediate currency, uh, they become part of this. And as I see it, it's a counterweight to one sole superpower dictating to the entire world with the military might of uh, all other countries combined and then some. Uh, I think it's much healthier to have a, a uh, a counterweight system of, of some sort, how it will sort itself out and 
uh, whether China will break, uh, whether Russia will break. Uh, it's, it's an open question, but after all, life is always an open question. So I, I think this is uh, the geopolitics of, of this whole crisis, the Arab Spring and so forth. And what happened in Syria, that was a Pentagon, CIA finance destabilization with Sarkozy's France playing a dirty, dirty role in there. Uh, the U.S. tried to get Turkey, the Erdogan government in Turkey, to play the dirty role that uh, Sarkozy played in the Libya uh, bombardment. Uh, he was forced to back down because 23 percent of the Turkish population, I was recently in Turkey for a presentation of, of the Gods of Money book, and uh, Erdogan was forced to back down because 23 percent of his own people are Alawite uh, Muslim, the same as al-Assad. And what happened is Russia and China this time, they made the mistake, and I was in China and in Russia, and I talked to people there uh, last fall after the, uh, the fall of, of the Gaddafi regime in Libya. They said we were duped, we were lied to by Washington, and uh, we didn't want to get involved, so we stayed neutral in the Security Council vote that allowed them to get away with murder. But this time we've drawn a line in the sand, because if Syria falls, then Iran will fall. Iran is a major source uh, playing outside the music of, of the uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, debt slavery system right now. So uh, they realize that uh, these dominoes, one by one, uh, if they just keep letting it happen. And that's causing huge headaches in Washington. They, uh, you know, the, Hillary Clinton acknowledges working with Al-Qaeda. You know, w wasn't this Osama bin Laden, this, this funny fellow uh, with this funny turban uh, back in 2001 that was supposed to be the number one enemy of America, now we're working with his organization? Uh, you know, really, uh, do they expect that we're so stupid and shor so short-term memory as, as some of these Pentagon planners or State Department planners, or, or what's really going on here? I think what's going on uh, with Syria, Israel, Iran, and so forth is, frankly, I don't think uh, the government in Israel is at all happy with the Arab Spring in any way, shape, or form. Here you have Muslim Brotherhood regimes coming into power in Egypt. You have them coming into power. The, the opposition in Syria is Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, and it's creating instability on Egypt's borders. I think, if anything, there's a, a, a very heavy dialogue covertly going on between Tel Aviv and, and Damascus about how to stabilize the Assad regime, because he poses no threat to Israel's security, quite the opposite. And uh, Assad plays a crucial role in keeping Lebanon, which is on the Israeli borders, keeping Lebanon stable. So I think it's quite different from how the media is, is playing it. Do you, do you think a, a, a potential war with Iran down the road, what are the risks uh, for, the, for the rest of the world? I've, I've said this for five years. There will be no shooting war, not from the Israeli side. I think the, the general staff of the Israeli Defense Forces would resign in a minute. And the, the former Mossad chiefs have said the same thing. Iran does not pose a threat to the security of Israel. There's all sorts of games going on, uh, uh, dog and pony shows and, and uh, saber rattling. Uh, but uh, a war is not going to happen, and certainly not, not from the side of the U.S. So uh, I, I don't see that. It's, it's uh, uh, manipulations going on to short uh, different stocks and to, to play around with the price of oil. Well, Bilderberg, I, I think uh, some people try to mystify the Bilderberg and make it into the, the great boogie bear that uh, is controlling the universe. That's, that's rubbish. It was set up uh, by certain U.S. elites in, in the early 1950s to coordinate policy between European elites. And this is a, a, an invitation-only club. Each year some politicians are invited because they're useful to the, the next phase. But, uh, for example, in 1973, and I have the actual document, the confidential document from the Bilderberg meeting of May 1973 in Salt Shabbat in Sweden. I talk about it in my book, uh, uh, Century of War. The oil shock of 1973-4 was actually discussed in the Bilderberg meeting six months before the Yom Kippur War, which triggered the Arab oil embargo, predictably, because they said they would do it if the U.S. continued to supply arms to Israel in a one-sided way. So it was, it was a pre-programmed shock that trashed the industrial economy of the West, the United States included. 
but it created a dollar bonanza. It rescued the dollar from a free fall, and it created a dollar bonanza for Chase Manhattan, Citigroup, J.P. Morgan, and uh, the other Wall Street gods of money banks. Uh, it also created a huge bonanza for Exxon, Mobil, the Seven Sisters oil companies, the British and American oil companies, and uh, gave them the loot to use to recycle those petrodollars from the high oil price and bring them in to uh, create the next phase of crisis. The major mainline media in the West is, is uh, if you want, it's embedded journalism, embedded in the machine of, of the Pentagon, the State Department, the UK Foreign Office, and, and uh, uh, NATO. And uh, their job is to uh, spread lies and propaganda so that ordinary people are in a delusional world about what's going on around them, even though they, uh, in their gut, they know that something drastically is wrong. So, uh, for example, the crisis of the euro, well, it has nothing to do uh, with what's said it, uh, about, the, about the Greek economy. The Greek economy is a tiny, tiny economy compared with the rest of Euroland. It's financial warfare. The financial warfare was launched at a time the dollar was facing freefall because of the huge take on of new treasury debt to, to bail out the banks of, of Wall Street. And just at that moment, uh, lo and behold, it was discovered that Greece had cheated on its debt back in 2002 to qualify for entry into the euro. And guess who helped them to cheat? Well, none other than Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase. So the Wall Street criminal banks that are behind this crisis, who never seem to end up in court or in jail, uh, which is the least that they uh, are worthy of for what they've done, uh, they're the ones who are orchestrating this as an all-out financial warfare on the one potential rival as a reserve currency to the dollar, and that is the euro uh, on the horizon at the moment. So this thing is, is playing out. Uh, at first, the European uh, governments were naive. They don't understand uh, modern financial markets in, in the way that, that uh, London and, and New York traders understand them. Uh, and I think they still don't understand them. They, they look at it very formally, especially in Germany where I live. But uh, it's warfare. It's warfare. And at this point, as I say in my speeches uh, all across Europe and uh, in, in Russia and in China, wherever I'm invited in Turkey, is the European elites are schizophrenic. They have two choices. One is to continue the Atlantic relationship with the United States and uh, sinking Titanic. Or they can begin building deeper bridges to the east, to Russia, to China, the countries of Eurasia, and through that, build their way out of, out of this paper money crisis with, with a real economy, real economic growth. Have you been to InfoWarsShop.com lately? Express your inner patriot with these brand new InfoWars t-shirts. Say it loud with the InfoWars bullhorn shirt. Or educate the sheeple with the Bill of Rights shirt. Grope the public's mind with the TSA shirt. And with this shirt, you can let the dark side know of the Rebel Alliance's power. All available at InfoWarsShop.com. For more than six years, I've talked on the air about creating a social network. PlanetInfoWars.com is in its beta phase. We're just launching it, and I want to invite all of you out there to be in on the ground level. Planet InfoWars is about people coming together, forming activist organizations, getting involved politically, hunting and fishing, gardening, dating. This is a place for people who love freedom to meet and to talk and to write and to post information. And I give you this pledge. We are not going to spy on you and sell your data to the New World Order. PlanetInfoWars.com is free, so people who love freedom can get together. Connect with people who are awake and know what we're facing. Be active. Organize. Take action. Go viral. Create. Contribute. Resist. Because resistance is victory. You are victory. It's waiting for you to breathe power into it. PlanetInfoWars.com And we are back. It's InfoWars Nightly News on this Monday, June 11th, 2012 edition. The websites are InfoWars.com and, of course, PrisonPlanet.com and PrisonPlanet.tv. 
Now, uh, John Rappaport uh, wrote an article at nomorefakenews.com, investigative journalist, frequent guest, basically saying that if Ron Paul and Rand Paul don't reverse themselves on this endorsement of Romney, and, and yes, folks, Ron Paul is coordinating with Rand, that's going on, that it's going to politically destroy them. And the firestorm is not just from Infowars.com. The Libertarian Party, Gary Johnson, we need to get him on to comment on this, uh, the Libertarian candidate, so many others uh, are pointing out that uh, this is the political move. And Ron Paul and Rand Paul are all about not being political, about being principled. Even if you, if you didn't agree with everything they were doing, this idea of going along with the system and compromising um, was something that was anathema to them. Well, now we've seen a big reversal, and the Libertarian Party points out Rand voted for sanctions, which his dad has said in the Constitution states is an act of war against Iran, a major escalation. He started doing a bunch of other stuff. So he started drifting about four or five months ago, but accelerating his drift, I guess, to get himself in line to be VP or four years from now to run as a Republican. And now, three days after this firestorm from last Thursday when he went on Sean Hannity to uh, endorse Mitt Romney with relish, uh, the spokesman, Mr. Hunter, Jack Hunter, uh, over at Campaign for Liberty, has come out on the front page with a response. And the headline at Infowars.com is, Rand's Romney endorsement focused around 2016 presidential run. Ron Paul campaign responds to controversy. And I'm going to read later some of the quotes by Jack Hunter. I mean, I mean, here's one of them. If Rand had not endorsed Romney in 2012, every single Republican in the race would use his non-endorsement to bash Senator Paul relentlessly. Well, Congressman Paul in 08 didn't endorse the Republican candidate. He said, sorry, neither one of these people's constitutional, Obama or Mitt Romney. So this is a big change. There's a, a hundred senators that have sold out to one degree or another. Making himself more like them tarnishes Rand Paul. But you see, the politicos around him they just want the next big job. So that's why they're all telling Rand and Ron this is the way to go. And I see Campaign for Liberty, because I get the literature, because I've donated, sending me all these local neocons in Texas saying they've got the seal of approval from Ron and Rand. So, so now this grassroots movement we built around Ron Paul and Rand Paul is more and more just becoming a rubber stamp to certify as, you know, Tea Party libertarian all of these Republicans. Three years ago, the Tea Party was bullhorning Republicans until they got on the bandwagon and made it partisan. Then they sold the idea that the Tea Party was started by mainline Republicans when it was started by 9-11 truthers and then picked up by Ron Paul. It was really started, of course, back in 1775-1776, but they've, they've totally co-opted it now where I get comments and emails saying, you're trying to co-opt the Republican Tea Party, Alex, you radical, and you're going to fail. Look, the whole system's coming crashing down. Either the globalists are going to use the crises they've created worldwide to bring in total global corporate fascism, using socialism on the grassroots to control us, or we're going to use the crises they've created to politically expose them and begin taking back ground that we've lost. And look, Ron Paul, Rand Paul have been focal points. And we're going to go to our guest, but I want to make this point. Focal points for liberty and exposing the private federal reserve. But they've miscalculated, and their handlers have miscalculated, a lot of big-time Republican operatives, if they think that most of us are just going to go along with them. I've seen polls of 95%, 96% against what Ron Paul has done. In fact, we're going to put another one up tonight uh, at Infowars.com, so go there and vote. It's, it's an IP-based system, so you can only vote once. It's somewhat scientific, and, and we'll see what happens there. Uh, but as there are more betrayals down the road, people are only going to turn against Ron and Rand that much more. I want to get behind these guys. I believe they're good guys, and they got into the expediency of, hey, let's join with the system, let's try to co-opt it. That's not going to work. You see the Republican system co-opting the constitutionalist ideas, not the other way around. Now, that's my commentary on the whole Paul situation here today. Uh, but let's turn to the uh, guy that heads up nomorefakenews.com. He, of course, has been an expert on ABC News, CBS News. He's written for LA Weekly, Spin Magazine, and many other newspapers. He's an investigative reporter. 
Uh, he was also nominated for a Pulitzer Prize uh, for an interview with the president of El Salvador University, where the military had taken over the campus. And he's just had amazing forethought uh, on so many issues, but especially medical tyranny. And John joins us because usually I call him to get him on the show. He contacted us and said, I want to come on and talk about this Ron Paul situation. So I want to get his take uh, on what's happened because I know he's been a supporter of the Pauls. John, great to have you here with us today. Good to be here, Alex. Thanks. Well, you heard my little rant there. Uh, what's your take on this overall? My take is that after the 2008 election, when Ron Paul did not endorse McCain, and in fact he advised his supporters to vote for any number, three or four different independents running on small parties and eventually sent it on Chuck Baldwin and endorsed him and so forth, that he did a turnaround. And he basically said, together with his son, Look, the plan has to be that somehow we rework the GOP. We work, we work the Republican Party. We infiltrate. We get inside the system, and we make long-term changes that will come to fruition down the road. Total delusion. Total wrong decision. Everything has worked against them on every move they've made in that direction. And now it's completely blown up with Rand's endorsement of Romney because Romney doesn't need him. The Republicans don't need him. They're going to kick Rand to the side of the road. He doesn't figure in any of their plans. All they really want to do is to neutralize for the moment the liberty movement, have their convention in Tampa, put Romney up against oh, his twin brother Obama, and let the election run. This is basically a tragic mistake and a tragic error in judgment by Ron Paul and his son Rand because if you're going to be an independent, you have to be an independent. Well, that's where all the power feel. was, and I want you to continue, but people watching this are going to say, wait a minute, because that's the new talking point. Ron Paul is not Rand Paul. Wait a minute. Last Thursday, they coordinated the, the press release by Ron Paul saying, okay, we can't win with the delegates now, something that's been clear for months. They just wanted to keep hopes up for donations and things and keep momentum. And then Rand comes out on Hannity the whole way it was done. The two guys live together, father and son in D.C. The whole thing is coordinated. I mean, I know the family. I know the insiders. I've had dinner with Rand Paul's top people just a few months ago. This is a coordinated deal. What do you say to the delusion that, hey, don't throw Ron Paul out with the bathwater. You know, he's not involved in this. No. It's a coordinated decision between the two of them obviously has to be they're not working at odds with each other they've decided on a strategy you know we're not going to play this as outsider independence rand is ron's legacy he's supposed to move forward with these ideas of ron and somehow you know implement them within the system within the republican party which is a total loser of a strategy and a delusion because the Republican Party, like the Democratic Party, sold out long ago to globalism. That's the basic unspoken doctrine of both political parties, and that's the way it's going to be. And that's something that everybody has to face up to. I mean, the liberty movement is far from dead. It's just that Ron Paul and Rand Paul took a bad wrong turn, a very bad wrong turn. You know, I ran for Congress in 1994 out of Los Angeles in the 29th District against Henry Waxman, who was a Democratic incumbent there for 20 years. I mean, you couldn't get even your toe in the door unless you were a Democrat in that area. And so, you know, I was a neophyte. I was naive. And I said to myself, well, I can't win as a Republican, can't win as an independent. So I'm going to have to run against Waxman in the primary as a Democrat, which I was not and never have been. But that was my mistake. And as I saw, as the campaign went on and on and on, I became more and more radicalized, more and more independent. I saw more of the corruption in the whole political apparatus, the national political apparatus. And I finally said to people that were supporting me, I said, you know what we're going to do if we go to Washington? The only thing that's right to do. We're going to have trucks roll around the city every day of the week with huge posters on the sides of the trucks that say corrupt congressman of the week, a photo, a name, and underneath the facts, 
where the guy's money comes from, where his votes went, how they magically align. That's just for openers. And we were going to do that every single week. I said, because if you're going to work in this corrupt system, you are obliged as an independent to begin by exposing every amount and detail, high and low, of corruption that you can possibly lay your hands on. Well, let's on. expand on that. I mean, we've seen Rand say, hey, do the sanctions that his own father says is an act of war. The Constitution states it is. We've seen him do a bunch of other stuff. The biggest thing I just mentioned is Campaign for Liberty now operating as this political action committee uh, or consultancy that, that politicians come to and basically hire and then run their campaigns through it, and then the Paul Mafia gets a cut of the money, and, and, and all these alarm bells have been going off because I've given them money, so I get these, these, these letters with these horrible CFR people and folks they're endorsing. I mean, what were they thinking? Because I know Ron Paul, I know Ron Paul, they've been good people. I mean, how do they just suddenly take such a turn and like Anakin Skywalker become Darth Vader? Or, or, or is there a way to turn them back? I, because I said last week, come out, clarify, do something. And instead they put out a release saying, hey, we need to be popular with Republicans. We'll get bashed if we don't do this. Well, the corrupt system's going down. Congress has a 9% approval rating. You want to be attacked. That's a seal of approval. What are they thinking? What happened? What do you think happened? The only thing I can think of, Alex, is as I say, after 2008, Ron Paul privately in his own mind did a reassessment and said, and I've had some confirmations from inside the campaign, that it wasn't going to work to be an independent anymore, which I think is a, you know, demented idea. And that he was going to have to somehow join up with the Republican Party in some way in order to try to, I mean, how, how ridiculous does this sound? Quote, take it over. I mean, because you have to realize, if the guy won the nomination for president, if Ron Paul could have made it all the way through, then he would become the titular head of the Republican Party. And that must have been his vision. If I can get that far, I can take this whole thing over and I can say, okay, here are the principles we really stand for. It was a wild dream. Exactly. And, and now the plan, and now the plan they admit is to get Rand in in four years. The system doesn't trust them. The system no. plans to stab them in the back. Of I mean, this course. is crazy. It's completely crazy. And, you know, anybody on the ground could have told them that. Millions of people in the liberty movement could have said to them, you're crazy. This is not going to work. Don't you get it? If you're going to be an independent, you have to be a complete independent. And now is the time to do that because not only, as you say, is the system going down in total corruption, but we've got the Internet. And we've got the Internet at such speed now, much different from 2008, where you can get out messages 24-7 all over the world and keep on getting those messages out. This would have been the year to be a true independent and say, I'm going to expose the whole thing. Well, exactly. Uh, the only way Ron Paul can get back and get that aura of, uh, of, of no compromise he had is to realize this mistake and to break with it and run third party, not to even win, but to shake things up, to get enough points to get in the debates. There's no way the media could ignore it. If he'd have done this months ago, when they stole Iowa and Maine, and even mainstream media had to admit later it was stolen, he would have gotten $50 million, $100 million given to him. He would have had people in the streets, a catalyst. Instead, they took this safe path to just fade off and become some political consultancy firm with stuttering Jesse Benton up there, uh, look, I'm going to tell Jesse Benton and all of them something. If I wanted to really be nasty, I know a lot of the inside stuff. I'm not going to get into it here. But the bottom line is this. To see this whole movement sold out, just so you guys can be big shots and hang out at the table with the big Republican pervert senators you know, up there, is so sad. And you guys are going to rue the day you did this. They're destroying, even if they were sociopaths, and I'm not saying they are, that deep well of true populist constitutional, but even mainline liberals were waking up, that deep well of respect they had that was even untapped. And, and to see that pissed away. Do you totally. agree? I mean, I mean, how much have they pissed away? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
And the right time would have been right after it was obvious to Ron Paul that they had stolen a couple of states from him. Four months that ago. This was not going to work. And if he had backed out at that moment and said, guess what, folks? Here's how corrupt the system is. And this is what I'm going to do about it. Now, I need you behind me. This is not going to work if I'm just out there on a limb screaming. This is legitimate. I'm an independent from this moment on, and I need millions of you to support me, not only with money, but wherever I show up. Then, instead of the media trying to cover up 15, 20,000 people showing up for a rally of his, you would have had 75,000, 100,000 people showing up, and they wouldn't have been able to put a clamp on that. And all of a sudden, you would have had something viable about liberty in this country politically. Now you would have seen... Exactly. He would have had 20 times the power to shape the debate and maybe even a chance to win. Then there's the assassination issue. People say, well, I'm sure they've been threatened. Well, you know what? I get threatened. And the point is, if Ron Paul said, don't let him JFK me, he would have gotten even more support and the elites wouldn't have dared do that. In the past, I said Ron Paul was founding father material. All I can say now is I have to retract that. And when I see a Ron Paul sign, people say, well, hey, he's still good. He's not the globalist. That's what makes it even more painful is that, is that he was totally on our side. And I loved him and, and respected him and put everything on it. And that's why it's personal now. You know, that's the issue. That's why across the board, people are hurt. I want you to comment on that. Give us your take on it, John. But also... Uh, what are you seeing out there in the grassroots? Are you seeing the same wild uh, anger uh, that I'm seeing from the former Ron Paul supporters? And how bad do you think this will be? You know, right now, there's no way for the Ron Paul supporters to get out of their reaction to this. But they have to. I mean, they have to because, you know, this is not the first time in history we're talking about a long time on this planet here that some leader has suddenly veered off in the wrong direction for whatever reasons and all of a sudden everybody else is left hanging with their ideals and their feelings out there blowing in the wind there has to be a regrouping and a recouping and to me the important thing to make clear because it was never really made clear before especially by the tea parties is to say look we're not looking for republican politics or democratic politics here we're looking for people who can run as independents because we're behind that and we'll vote for that if that's the way you want to play it you can't you can't allow somebody in the door who's going to say I'm for you, but I'm also part of the system, and we're going to work it out later on. Because we see what happens when you try to work it out later on. You get betrayal. You get people absolutely going nuts here who have worked for, you know, their bones off for this. But i got to tell you, I've talked to other people inside the Ron Paul campaign who said to me, I expected this to happen. They're smart. They're not just people who feel, you know, totally betrayed and there's nothing they can do about it. There's some very smart people in there at ground level who saw this coming and now they have to make it clear. If we're talking politics here, we're talking independent politics, not Republican or Democrat. We don't want to reform these parties. We want to beat these parties. Well, look. These parties are eugenicists. They're globalist. And th I want to talk about that after we're done talking about the polls in 2012 and where you see things going. But looking out into the future, what do you see happening to Ron Paul and Ron Rand Paul now? Because the political capital they had, they have shot with a 12-gauge shotgun. They have blown a hole in the bottom of their boat. Uh, the political hacks they've got working for them. Ran and Ron are hiding out from this right now, which is the worst possible sign. They've sent their lackeys yeah. out to say, hey, we want the Republicans to like us. Hey, folks, we, the public liked the polls because you didn't want the establishment liking you. But where do you see this going? I mean, how do you see this ending if they don't come out and re uh, reverse course? Or is that too late? Done and done. They're both done. Rand may continue to hold political office, whatever. But Ron is done. He's going to retire pretty soon. His son is a non-factor, either inside the system or outside the system. Done and done. The movement for liberty is going to have to select and find new avenues and rethink this. You, it's, they're done. That's it. And why do you say that? 
because how do you recoup? I mean, is Ron Paul going to come out and say, look, you've misunderstood me. I want to make this clear to you, and I'm going to spell it out in a way that you can truly understand. And Rand is going to do the same thing. Is this going to happen? I don't think so. It's certainly not going to happen with Rand because he's already enthusiastically thrown his hat in the ring for uh, Romney, so he's done completely. I mean, of what value is he to the GOP? Nothing. To the liberty movement? Nothing. What about his father, who's a far more important figure? I just don't see Ron Paul being willing to come forward at this point and say, you've totally misrepresented me and I'm going to explain exactly what really happened and convince people that yeah. he has been No, instead, I think that's going instead to they're having their spin doctors come out and say, Ron is not Rand. And people are like, more politics? And, and again, I, I've tried to be calm about this. I've tried to be measured and, and, and say, hey, let's give them benefit of the doubt. Let's, let's give it some time. But then I start thinking about everything else I've been seeing the last six months or so. And then I get angry that I'm supposedly somebody who isn't going to be manipulated. But because of my 17-year relationship with Ron Paul and five, six years, well, I've interviewed Rand probably 10 years ago, 10-year relationship with Rand, that I even began to become co-opted. And then that, again, it goes back into that personal personal area that that's why it makes me double pissed yeah well i can see that i mean i haven't had that kind of relationship so it doesn't affect me emotionally in the same way i just don't see objectively how ron paul can suddenly reverse this trend that has exploded in the last few days i don't see what he can say i mean what's he going to do he's going to say well my son is my son and he did this on his own, and I have absolutely nothing to do with that. Is he really going to say that? No, he's not. First of all, because it's not true, because this was a coordinated effort. And secondly, he's not going to throw his son under the bus because his son is supposed to be his legacy. So he's tied in a knot, and I don't see how he can work his way I, out of it. I think you're right. Uh, you know, I've talked to a lot of campaign people off record high level who were upset about the way things were going, even – four or five months ago who were warning me and just saying, well, they're listening to too many insiders. And then I talked to others who were like, Ron Paul's a rock star who were starstruck. And that's not what this is about. And so I think delusion really crept in. And, and you know, that was, that was one of the first things you talked about was this is delusional. And I think you've hit on something there. I think this is an example to all of us of how power can become delusional. Absolutely. It is delusional, and especially when it seems to be all uh, focused on a particular individual, you know, because then people say, well, I'm throwing my markers in on this person, on this person, this person, this person who's going to carry the ball and this person we can trust and so on. And there's a, for a lot of people who do that, I'm not saying everybody, but for a lot of people who do that, they then sort of psychologically remove themselves from accountability and responsibility because they say, you know, the guy's going to carry it. Our leader's going to carry the ball. He's going to do it. We can trust him. We know, we know, we know. And then you say, hey, wait a minute. Do you see that he's still part of the system here? Hey, this guy is running as a Republican. I mean, I know that he's already run as a libertarian in the past and he didn't endorse McCain and he got very angry with Reagan and he eventually resigned from the Republican Party at one point and so on. But right now, you know, this guy's running as a Republican, so you better think, you know, look at this. What is going on here? But a lot of people, you know, they operate under this delusion. If we can invest everything in somebody then everything's going sure. to be okay, and it never is. It never Sure, is. what I did was, is I knew Ron Paul had such a great voting record and never compromised that I was confident that he was a vehicle to educate people, so I got behind him. And then as I saw the signs with his son and even Ron the last four or five months, I, I, I was thinking I was wrong, and then basically the dam broke. And I think everybody was noticing this. That's why I think this backlash is so big. You describe it as this trend. Are you seeing the same thing I'm seeing? I mean, this is the firestorm of firestorms. And normally I do take a pleasure in seeing corrupt politicians exposed and brought down. They're not really corrupt more than just taking a wrong turn. And it's very disgusting to watch them burn up and also know they're delusional so they probably don't even realize it yet. 
but it feels good to know that I've gone the right course and haven't sold out by staying delusional. I only scraped the edge of it, but then it's, it's, it's kind of sicky sweet. You know, I, I like, like it's fulfilling to do the right thing and say what I really think, but it's also kind of sad to watch, watch the city that we hoped, you know, we could build burn. Yeah, it is sad. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And I think that somewhere along the line, somehow, Ron and Rand got into the delusion themselves, and they thought, okay, we've got enough power behind us now. And with this power, we can actually torque and turn the screws on the system and the Republican Party in particular. But somehow they got that idea in their heads. Look at the numbers of people coming out. Look at the support, the money. Look at how our ideas are finally taking hold in a way that they've never taken hold before. I mean, that had to be extremely gratifying to Ron after all these years in the trenches to see this, the numbers of people turning out and thinking to himself, okay, maybe this is the time. Maybe we've got enough behind us here where we can walk in into the room, sit at the table and say, you know what, guys, we're here, but you're going to have to listen to us now yes. because we have enough power. And they're wrong. Yeah, because they're it's a table wrong. of puppets. Ron Paul was good because he would address the puppet masters, the globalists, the mega banks, the IMF, the World Bank, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, who publicly merged. He was addressing them. And then now he's going into the pupperarium, you know, this, this, you know, this artificial uh, system and believing that they can change that. Uh, it is mind-blowing, mind-blowing to behold. But I think you're right. We've now, John, got to look at the fact that, hey, the fact that liberty's become so popular, that's a manifestation of all of our work and the fact that so much of what we talked about is now unfolding and just move on. And perhaps this serious throttling that Ron Paul and Rand Paul are getting will move them closer back to the straight and narrow. But again, even if they cry Mia Copa, Ron Paul, I would say, has lost that aura. He definitely has. But that Mia Copa is something that he's got to do if he thinks he's going to get back any credibility. He's going to have to say, <laughs> I was deluded. You know, basically, that's what he's going to have to say. I thought that I had enough behind me to walk into the room, sit down, and make some real changes, and I was terribly wrong. Well, his campaign people are on the news are starry-eyed about a speaking slot at the RNC that hardly no one even oh. watches now. I mean, it's delusional. Right. Oh, man. Yeah. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? The only thing that could happen is that inside the convention, Ron Paul supporters decide that they're going to take it to everybody else that, you know, this is horrendous what's happened. And therefore they're just not going along with the show. Well, That was my final they're point was Ron play. Paul told them be respectful. Cops are billy clubbing people to the hospital who are the delegates and are told, give it to Romney. And Ron Paul's like, now you be respectful. Yeah. Yeah. That's the last straw. <laughs> that is the last straw. And as far as giving a speech, you know, oh, well, okay, we'll give you 15 minutes, uh, you know, at uh, s dinner hour when nobody cares and you can drone on about something or other and maybe we'll put a plank in the platform somewhere and thank you very much. Big deal. Means it's nothing. a joke. Absolutely. I mean, what is it about people, even media people? Because I've been with famous people around other famous people, and they get all wild around a big movie star. And uh, I was talking to one movie star, and he talked about Al Gore was at his house and was just falling down for hours that he was at this movie star's house. And the, and the politicians want to be like movie stars, and it's all illusion. And the Hollywood stars know it's all illusion. Most of them that are conscious know it's a prison and are embarrassed about it. Uh, and, 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 and then I see the Ron Paul people and stuff. They're so starstruck by television and all this. And the audiences aren't even big anymore. It's these giant facades and you see full grown men falling to their knees for it. It's something, you know, in the human psychology that wants has always apparently wanted to go for this, you know, it's this. You know, I encountered this as a reporter early in my career and got immunized against it very quickly. But I, I've seen it with a lot of other people in this profession. You know, somebody says, well, 
you know, I got a story on CBS News, or they want to interview me. Fantastic. It's like I've arrived. It's not, okay, I'll do this thing because I can make this work for the ideas that I'm trying to actually spread here and wake people up with. No, it's the starstruck thing. It's like, oh, we got a story in so-and-so. Oh, did you see the spread on so and so? Oh, fantastic. Or power wow, struck. Really what about people, I've seen it with so many that finally get a little media attention and suddenly they go from being a nice person to arrogant and crazy. Uh, I'm sure you've seen that too with just... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, people that I thought I knew suddenly turned out to be somebody else entirely. You know, all of a sudden, it's like somebody's dream came true, and then they could become the snot-nosed idiot that they always really wanted to be. Apparently, that's what was hiding in the closet all along. If I ever get the chance to be famous, then I can just take it to everybody that I ever knew. You know, it's, it's like a revenge fantasy of some kind. I've seen that play out. I've seen all kinds of insanity from people that just get a little of that taste. Well, I know power. you went to Amherst and are a, a philosopher. You have a degree in philosophy. What is the, I mean, let's diagnose my psychology here. I come off as arrogant because my brain's moving quick. I'm, I'm, I'm angry. I'm aggressive. It's, it's, it's not even confidence. It's more desperation. But in the final equation, the more petty temporal power I get, because life's so quick, it's nothing, tiny planet, you know, uh, the more power I get, the smaller I feel. And the more I get concerned that I do the right thing and, and the more humble I get, Versus most people, I've noticed you're, you're humble and you, know, uh, you have uh, you know, quite a bit of attention on you. What is the difference between people who get more power and become more humble versus most people who get power and become absolutely power mad? One of the things I'll tell you is, do you have any real ideas or was that always another delusion? Because if you ever had real ideas... When you get power, you realize, okay, this is pretty good because now I have the opportunity to try to use the ideas to wake there people you go. up, which is what you've done, you see. But if you never really had any ideas that you believed in, all of a sudden you get power, and what it reflects to you in the mirror is that you really had nothing all along. There was nothing there. All there was was a desire to be famous or powerful, and now it seems like your only option is to play that out, to play out that role, to be that person. You know, I'm going to go way back here, 1973. Uh, I started investing in a couple of markets because some friends of mine made some money, and it just turned out I got into a bull market. Didn't know really what I was doing. Had no idea, but I thought I knew what I was doing. And temporarily, I say that underlined because I lost it all. I made a bunch of money, like overnight. And all of a sudden, I noticed that I was a completely different person for about three days. I was walking around like I was king of the hill because I had no idea how to handle it. And what I realized at the time was that I had no real commitment or conviction about anything. I thought I did, but I was absolutely wrong. This was like nine years before I even started working as a reporter. And I thought to myself, man, you're in trouble, baby. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you suddenly got schizophrenia. You realized that you got nothing here. You better decide what you're really convinced of, regardless of whether you're poor, rich, powerful, powerless. You got to serve something. You've got to serve somebody. And I think you've really given us pure crystallized veritas here. You just condensed down in my stuttering, halting way. What I'm trying to say is that that's why I feel crushed by it, crushed in an energetic way, but, but that, oh my God, I've got all these ideas. I'm in love with ideas and freedom. And these people are asleep and they're not really living. They're following some narcissistic, imaginary, you know, uh, grand uh, delusion. I want to unlock minds, not because I have the answers, but because I just want people to survive and, and, and thrive and move to the stars. Oh, my God, we've got the worst psychopaths running things. <clears throat> and I feel incredibly weak and pathetic in that I'm awake and can have all these kaleidoscope ideas that, are, that turn out to be validated and accurate, and that as bad as I am, I'm a giant compared to a bunch of other people, and then you see people you even look up to acting like children, you're like, my God, I've got to do a better job somehow transmitting info to people to lift us out of this, because in the final equation, 
I look at my little nine-year-old son, but especially my little daughters, who are so innocent and sweet. I know the world they're about to be put out into, and I just feel the ancient struggle for all that is good versus all that is bad, all that is fetid. I mean, I'm ranting here, but I mean... Uh, no, I'm following you. I'm following you all the way. This is exactly right. I mean, what you're, to me, what you're saying is something that has been, you know, I've been on that road for quite some time now. All I can say is I get tremendous amount of pleasure when I see somebody wake up. It's like, wow, this is a good day, baby. You know, somebody woke up or a bunch of people woke up. To see that, to feel that is a thrill to me because it's kind of like, coming out of a, a nightmare, you know, or out of a dream or out of a doldrum, you, you, you launch an idea like you, I mean, story after story on InfoWars every day, man, that can wake people up. And when you see it actually happening and you, you know, it's happening, it's to me, it's a tremendous thrill. It's like, wow, this is what it's all about. And conversely, when you don't see it, happening or you don't feel it happening or you see people marching following the pipe or you're not going or, to the full potential it's like we've got the, the 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 moment now to try to reach people and then you've got all these incredible ideas but then when you try to articulate them sure they're effective but it never has all the complexity of the thought versus trying to articulate it well I don't know what I can say about that, Alex, but I mean, having listened to you for some time, uh, I think the articulation is, is not only there, but it's mind blowing at times, the way you tie things together. This relates to that, and this relates to that, because you're encyclopedic. I mean, I see what's happening on InfoWars, that you're drawing in tremendous amounts of information that would put me in the hospital on a daily basis if I had to integrate all of this. And you're connecting dots from this to that to this to that, and building the image of what is actually happening behind it all. To me, I mean, I don't know what you want, but that to me is major articulation and I think it blows a whole lot of people away because that's what they've been waiting for. Somebody to come along and say, it's not just this, this and this folks, don't you see the connections? And besides that, it's this, this and this. I think people are getting that from you every day. Well, I appreciate that. That's I just, I, just with, I know with you and myself and others, it's the opposite of a power trip. It's more just like, you know, the reality shock. And I know so many people just want to retreat into diversions, distractions. Because there's something, you know, comfortable on the surface about that. But overall, those are very unhappy people because it's not rewarding. It's just when we get so close to the flame, uh, you know, sometimes it gets a little bit hot. But expanding on this philosophical uh, discussion, obviously the awakening's here. Thanks to your works, Ron Paul's work, so many others. Globally, humanity has a survival instinct, and through all the propaganda, people know things are going in the wrong direction. What do you expect the establishment to do as the quickening accelerates? I mean, I see them coming in with their counter-quickening, the police state, the drones, the drugging, the, you know, the propaganda, but, but I only see their intensification validating everything we've done and actually feeding back against them. I mean, I, 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 I don't just say this to be optimistic. Victory is right in front of us if we just take it in our hands. But people just can't say, oh, well, John Rappaport or G. Edward Griffin or, or David Icke or somebody else is out there. You know, this revolution of awakening uh, is here, but it's extremely volatile, almost like nitroglycerin. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I love about your work is that you you anticipate what they're going to do <laughs> you know not only do you call it when they do it but you anticipate what's up the road because you know what they're going to do is more false flag operations obviously i mean to create crises that's that's their only option is to try to convince everybody oh but there was this threat and we got the, oh look at what happened over here that we have to react to and so forth to keep the pot boiling forever if necessary to try to rein in the global population under one roof which is their you know that's their crazy perverted dream so that's to me one of the major things that you're incredibly alert about and that we all have to 
the alert about is people tend to, oh my God, look what's happening over there. We got to do something about that. Yeah, wait a minute. Is that what's really going on over there? Is that what's really happening? Is, is all of the you know crazy stuff that's happening in the Middle East now really the reason to go in there and do something militarily? Or is the whole thing a charade and a delusion from the beginning that's been perpetrated in order to convince us that you know we have to be a military empire here and all of that and take control to me that's the basic move that they always make and as they get more desperate they're going to do that they're going to invent one crisis after another to try to rope everybody in that's that's their main strategy that's that's how they're going to try to deal with the awakening but it's not really going to work i mean because as you say this is more uh, in a, I don't want to sound like a, you know a vulture, but I mean, this is food for people who are awake, who say, you see that operation over there? That's a phony operation. This is why they did it. This is what the purpose is. This is what you're telling you. And this is what we really should be doing here or not doing. Don't get sucked into it. And you give people five or six or seven or eight of these, they begin to wake up, man. They say, holy mackerel, man. The world that I've been viewing is mainly a series of operations that have been launched to give me the delusion that I'm living in reality when this is just concocted. Exactly, and I found people want reality. It's like the Matrix. Even if it's shabby, it's real versus the, the fake wall of glitz and it's all starting to come to a head. As, as much as we think this is the quickening now, it's just the quickening towards the quickening towards the quickening, layer after layer uh, towards some fantastic things. And, and, and it's our destiny to decide the future. And if good people who recognize uh, the, the crazy, insane narcissism of the elite, I, I, I mean, that's one big realization I've had, and I want your take on this, John, and then, and then any other news items you want to mention here, because I don't want to keep you too long, and I've got things to do. That that no, uh, that that we tend to think ruling elites are so smart and so great, and they do hire experts. They are dominant. They are willful. They have a will to power. I mean, I don't want to underestimate them, but there's a lot of uh, nepotism going on. There's a lot of delusion as well within the power structure. That is what's really dangerous: is all the weapons they've gotten things, and, and that history shows they are delusional that they're really not even that smart. I liken them to cancer. If cancer had a consciousness, it would say, well, I'm taking over the body. I'm, I'm in charge. Look, I can do whatever I want. But in six months, it's going to kill its host. And that's my message to the ruling class. I mean, you guys have got to know history. Uh, you're knocking down all the laws. You can steal a bunch of property and ideas. But you're knocking down firewalls that protect your old corrupt system as well. So in a way, they're flouncing, floundering corruption running out of control is actually going to be their own antibodies that destroy them. Do you see what I'm saying? I do indeed. And I agree with you that, there, that this is all part of a very narcissistic outlook. You know, it's like what they used to call in philosophy solipsism, where, you know, the, the entire world looks like the way you see it and nothing else. That's all there is. And that's the way they've been for forever, as far as I can see, historically. You know, they're so involved with themselves all the time and their particular crazy vision of things that they don't make good decisions quite, uh, you know, quite a bit of the time. They're not making good decisions even for their own cause. They're killing the goose that lays the golden egg. I mean, what do they think all these mega corporations that are so powerful are going to do when instead of having, let's call it maybe a billion people in the world that can buy their products now, there's going to be 500 million because they're driving more and more people into insane poverty with, uh, you know, carbon taxes and all this global warming hoax nonsense. What do they think those mega corporations are going to say when all of a sudden they say, you know, uh, we could produce uh, 50 times as many cars on our assembly lines as we can sell because all of a sudden you idiots have driven so many people into extreme poverty in the world that nobody can buy our products anymore. I and mean, they've talked about th that, they though. That. They plan to shift to the new economy of drones, combat robots, and technicians to make sure they're working as a new war economy 
to exterminate us, and that's their answer in the post-industrial world, is the future doesn't need us. I mean, do, do most of the minions serving the system think they're going to have a place at this technotronic, biomechanical uh, hell? I don't think so. I don't think, I mean, they might think so, but they're certainly not. But, you know, I just don't think that no matter how they shift into perpetual wartime economy, that that's really going to make up the difference between what these multinational mega corporations, I'm talking about all of them, think is in their rosy future for selling their products all over the world. Then they're going to come to a crash. They really are. I mean, I don't think you, I mean, okay, so you want to make another 50,000 or 100,000 drones? Yeah, okay, maybe you can get GM to do that for you, and they don't care about cars anymore for a while. But eventually, it's going to come back to haunt them badly because they really, in their narcissism, they have this dream, some of these real maniacs like Prince Charles, you know, I'm living in a country club and it's a wonderful thing with the golf courses and forests and animals and very few humans and it's all just a dream and we've eliminated, you know, so many people that we're not bothered by that anymore. And then all of a sudden, you know, some of his buddies say, you know, Charlie, uh, we run these corporations. We can't sell anything anymore to anybody because, you know, You've won the game with your insane uh, vision of narcissistic utopia, and economies have crashed long ago, in case you've noticed. I mean, I'm just sort of making up a script here, but there are people inside the power elite who understand this already, that they're, uh, you know, they're the less crazy ones, shall we say, are looking at the more crazy ones and saying, we got to stop these people. They're taking us all completely down the toilet. The whole planet is going down the toilet. And this is where I think, as you say, these guys are not that smart. They make mistakes and screw-ups all yeah, the time. Yeah, they've just got the power to issue currency and credit, and they've been in control so long, and we're apathetic. It seems like they're invincible. The truth is the greatest danger is these nuts destroying us. I want to bring up a weird article, just because I first saw this 15 years ago, and didn't believe it, and then later it was on the mainstream news, and I confirmed it, that it's not just German royalty that runs England, because the, you know, the media says, okay, they're saxe coburg Gothas, but they're really from Romania and, and Hungary and places, and I'm not knocking those folks overall, but uh, the point is, is that, that Prince Charles, his mother, all of them, the direct line is to Vlad the Impaler. And, and, and then I learned that he lives half the year in Transylvania and actually lives in one of Dracula's own castles. Uh, folks, I'm not, I'm not kidding. Blood the Impaler. Not, we're not saying they're real vampires. I'm just saying these legends are always connected to things. And then I learned that when royalty or nobles die, and this is actually uh, in, um, well, I mean, here's a mainstream news article uh, right here on it. Uh, 100 vampire graves discovered. Reuters, AP, they all reported on it. Uh, this particular article is out of newsfeed, uh, Time Magazine, uh, time.com, and they, they dig up royalty in Transylvania, and they have sp spikes in their heart. Now, now, obviously, I'm not saying they're real vampires, but here's Associated Press. Prince Charles relaxes on trip to Transylvania after Diamond Jubilee, and again, this is an article about how he loves to stay there. What, what is going on in there? I mean, where do these legends... Uh, come from, because if you want to describe the, the globalists, they are like social vampires, cultural vampires, warmongering vampires, psychic vampires, but, but now there's this obsession with vampirism and all of this in the culture, and then I trace it back, uh, and, and I have like Daily Mail articles where the royal family has groom of the stool, they didn't really get rid of it, and they've got and, and, and they're caught, you know, even 100 years ago eating body parts, that, you know, Daily Mail. I, I mean, I guess, look at Caligula, married his horse, Nero. I guess that's what elites do. What is this from your perspective? It's some kind of, uh, I'll use the word, inbreeding. And I guess, I mean, it's physical inbreeding, but it's, it's a, to me, it's a form of, extreme isolationism over the centuries, these families that are so removed from everybody else. I mean, I've known a few people 
on the fringes of this in my life. Would you like to come over to my house, uh, you know, during the Christmas vacation? And I go over to this house and it's like, uh, you know, walking into another world of tremendous luxury that has the feeling that you're in a mausoleum or an insane asylum. And the people give you that sensation. Hello. You know, I mean, as if they've been living in a, in a mausoleum museum for centuries. Who are these people? They have a lot of power. But they're so isolated from generation to generation. And in my life, in my own experience even, if you isolate people long enough, especially if they have you know privilege so they're not starving to death, they're living very comfortably, they go insane. They develop all kinds of bizarre fantasies and obsessions and phobias because they're just so out of touch with reality for so long. And they begin to grab onto myths and legends about blood, you know, because they've been taught about bloodlines. And so, oh, blood, yes, blood, oh, yes. It's like a desperate attempt on their part to relate in a completely psychotic way to what they think the world is. And of course, it isn't that at all, but they develop. I mean, I've seen this happen in people who end up, you know, unfortunately under the care of psychiatrists who then drug them and shock them to death. But before that even happens, they're very unstable, very wealthy, very unstable, very privileged, very isolated. And when you talk to them, they sound like they're talking from another dimension. They're just totally out of touch with reality. They're obsessed. They're phobic. They're in living in fantasy. John, I am always, I, and I don't just kiss up to most of my guests like this. I'm always amazed by your 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 research, your depth of, of of understanding, because what you're saying adds to my historical research. I want you to add to this. Then we'll move on to any other tidbits you want to impart, because I've been asking all the questions. But I can just bring up something random like this, and you're spot on with it, and then expand even on you know uh, my limited knowledge. I have learned that in almost every culture, syphilis, because the, you know, the royalty and the wealthy, the priest class, were having sex with the uh, local temple prostitutes, the rest of it. Syphilis, of course, causes mental illness, psychotic outbreaks. Jack the Ripper, the prince, had it. Back then, the only treatment was another toxic poison that made you even more insane, but did limit the growth of the, uh, the microbes in the brain that literally uh, honeycomb it out. And that, of course, is arsenic that all, they've dug up the, the Egyptian royals, they've dug them all up, and the inbreeding, deformed, uh, almost all of them had syphilis, even at birth, syphilis you know, being passed on many times, syphilitic brains and inbreeding, uh, just total psychopath crazies, but with giant armies and priest class saying they're God <laughs> and whole bureaucracies built around them. And that's why all over Transylvania, where they got some inbred elites, Vlad the Impaler's kids, this is, you know, mainline news, would ch chop kids' heads off and bathe in their blood. So, of course, the locals would go dig them up and put stakes to their hearts. They're like, the guys living in the castle, don't go out at night. They want to eat your butt because they had syphilis and were running around like Jack the Ripper. Uh, inbred syphilitics, I mean, there it is. And, our, and, and of course, yeah. uh, uh, eugenics comes along 160 years ago and says your blood is superior and then these guys buy into it. I mean, they're crazy. They, and then the elite said, we're going to cure our deformities by eugenics. We're going to breed these five scientific families together, the Wedgwoods, the Galtons, the, the, uh, the Huxleys, the uh, Darwins, and then almost all their kids die or they're insane and vampiric. I mean, I, I think we've hit on the key to understanding the elite here. Your comments on that? Yeah, I think you're spot on with this. This is you know, if you somehow, some way, I mean, I, I don't know the, the details on this, but it's my experience that if you get out and mix it up a, enough in your life, you begin to develop your own internal kind of immunity, you could say, which is not separateness. It's just you learn to live with life as it is around you to enough so that you, you know, you're okay. You function, you understand what's going on. If you disagree with it, you disagree with it. That's fine. But I mean, if you now are in this tremendous kind of isolation that I was talking about, and then on top of that, you've got diseases like syphilis that are going down the line from generation to generation because you're inbreeding it and you can't get away from it because, oh, we have to keep the family within the family within the family. I mean, now 
you don't have that kind of immunity anymore. You don't have that inner strength. All you can muster is some sort of a perverse sense of, well, we got the armies, we got the power, we got the control, we're in charge. That's our that's our face card, our whole card, every card. That's our only card. And we got to play that over and over again because we've got nothing else. I mean, if you sat down and talked with the Queen of England and you said, uh, look, can we talk off the record? You're not the Queen. I'm not who I am. We're just a couple of people here talking. Is that possible? I mean, can we have a conversation? My sense of things is that you probably would walk away saying, man, there's not much going on there. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's just to bring it down to earthly terms. There's just not much going on there because what do these families really have to say or offer? Nothing. I mean, where's their experience? Everything is about control, domination, and so And forth. giant fancy I mean, peacock outfits and wooden. They want to program us because they're so programmed. I would say so. That's right. That's all they understand. Is programming. I mean, you look at uh, Darwin, you look at Malthus, you look at historically the people <coughs> who were trying to tell us, what were they trying to tell us? That we're biological machines and we're nothing else. And there's else. something wrong with and us, it, like Prometheus. Humans are a malfunction. We've got to be exterminated. It's that idea that we're trash because the truth is, if you read the philosophy of these diseased kings, they hate looking into the village and seeing happy families and giggling children and wealth. They want feudalism because they want that ugliness they see in the castle prison to be projected out onto those. The truth is, New World Order, you're ugly, you're diseased, and we don't hate you for it, but you're dangerous, so we have to deal with you. Stop telling us we're bad. You're bad. The only way you're ever going to find solace is to join humanity and get out of this gothic, macabre crap you're into. Perfect. Perfect. They look in the mirror. They see how ugly they are. That's their own problem. Nobody else's. But now they've got to project it out on everybody else to make everything else look as ugly as they are because, you know, they can't stand what they see when they look in the mirror. That's their problem. That's always been their problem. All right, John, I've been ranting. Incredible discussion as usual. No more fake news dot com. Um, one last question. I want to give you about five minutes to make any points you want, which and we can talk about next time you're wrong, because I'm sure they'll be intriguing. Uh, no more fake news dot com. The books, all your materials, great work is up there. The Matrix Revealed, excellent book, uh, excellent work, uh, excellent uh, v video presentations, YouTube. It's all up there. And of course, people can also follow us at PrisonPlanet.tv. If you were Ron Paul, I know you wouldn't have made the decision he and Rand made, but in that concerted operation, that coordinated operation, what would you do right now to reverse this? I know we talked about it, but I want your full answer. And then you've got the floor for any items and uh, points you've got. Well. My answer, if I were Ron Paul, is, like I said before, I would do a mea culpa. I would say, I'm wrong. I was wrong, I am wrong, and I'm going to fix it. And here's, here's what I did that was wrong. It wasn't an attempt to hurt you people or to hurt anybody. It was just, <coughs> excuse me, it was just that I got into this mindset. I was fed up with trying to be an independent, always on the outside looking in, and I thought that finally we had enough support to make it happen, that we could walk in and sit down at the table with enough power to force things to happen in the way that you want them to happen and I want them to happen. But I was wrong. The system is way too corrupt for that. It's just not going to work because they will try to co-opt everything that I say or do if I'm part of that system, and they'll do it to you too. They'll do it to all of us. And that's what I've learned, and it was a, a very bad, tragic mistake. And now I've got to convince you that I'm the same guy that you used to think I was before this past week, and that's not going to be easy. But I'm going to start by saying that I'm going to run for president I don't care how many votes I get or how few as an independent starting right now. And I'm going to do it again in four years or somebody who's as good as I am and knows what I know or more is going to do it. But I'm going to do it right now. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I'm never going to be any of those things. I'm not on the libertarian ticket or any ticket. I'm running as an independent and this is what I stand for. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So sorry for what I did. And as for my son, 
I'm going to talk to him and let him know that he has to make his own decisions based on what I am saying to you now. And I pray that he makes the right decisions, but that's up to him. This is where I stand and spell it out again. This is where I stand on this and that, and that's why I'm running, and this is what I want. Not to go into Washington as part of any party. But instead, they've got feeble responses by their minions that, oh, we want the Republicans to like us. I, I, you know, I hope they turn back now. Okay, John, spin the wheel. What is on your mind other than the info, the incredible 50 minutes we've been talking here? What else is on your radar screen? Yeah, this has been great, Alex. <laughs> really great. Wow. Uh, FDA, another smoking gun, has appeared on the horizon. I'm going to be writing about this in the next few days. You know, you helped me break the story that the FDA knows that their approved drugs are killing at least 100,000 people a year in the United States. That's a million per decade. Now we have a new study. I've got the details on it. Other people have the details on it. So don't shoot me before I write the article. Thank you very much. Um, it's out there, but I'm going to give it a real good going over. It's a good study, and it shows that working from FDA reports, in other words, reports submitted to the FDA of deaths from FDA-approved medical drugs, these researchers discovered 128,000 deaths a year in the United States every year from FDA-approved drugs. It's another smoking gun, another log on the fire. They need, I mean... Talk about Ron Paul. If I was Ron Paul somehow and got magically elected, first day in office, I would walk over to the FDA and say, hello, you're done. Shut the place down. You've got 10 hours to get out. We're fumigating the joint. It's over. Finished. No more cabinet post. We're starting over. You guys are guilty of murder. Mass murder, genocide. So now we've got more evidence of that. It's another major piece in the puzzle. Yeah, Ron Paul, speaking of Ron Paul in closing, I mean, he's gotten less aggressive the last six months. He, he's not really even pushing impeachment for the war crimes and Obama saying the UN's the military's boss. I mean, I, again, I, 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 uh, they made some deal behind the scenes, and that's clear now, and I think they're going to get screwed in the end. No question about it. I think they're screwed already. Oh, it's a firestorm. All right. Well, John Rappaport, uh, thank you so much for all the time. Hey, Alex, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much. This was really a great conversation, whether it was on the air or off the air. I feel much more empowered. I do, thank too. You. I always feel empowered talking to you. Thank you so much. Okay, Alex. Well, that was a great interview with John Rappaport. Again, I'm Alex Jones of InfoWars.com. Again, I couldn't do it without the crew. Uh, Rob Dew's on vacation right now, like my right-hand man. But uh, Marcos Morales, John Bound, uh, Darren McBreen, three guys did all this today with yours truly. Again, couldn't do it without these guys. Uh, their passion for freedom, uh, their passion for the news and the information, uh, is just amazing. And we couldn't do it without you, the viewers, and the supporters of InfoWars Nightly News. One membership, don't forget, is really six. With your username and passcode, six people can log in simultaneously uh, at PrisonPlanet.tv, and we've got a 15-day free trial running. If you just watch this on YouTube or uh, all the other channels out there, think about supporting us. That's how we hire more reporters, and Lord knows we need them, and more editors and crew. Uh, and so we can expand this operation against the globalists while we still have some freedom on the Internet. The system's trying to shut down freedom on the web and admitting that they're doing it, as we covered earlier with the UN trying to take over the web, because we're hurting them. The system is concerned for a reason. You've got power. We've got power together. Those of us that don't want to run around the woods in Transylvania like Prince Charles, those of us that just want to have a happy, good life, you know, those of us that don't have syphilitic brains or aren't inbred, those of us that don't think humanity is ugly and bad, those of us that love life, those of us that are competent and confident, we've got to learn that we've got to seek power to protect ourselves from the scum. Again, evil triumphs because good men do nothing. We don't want power. We don't want the spotlight. Well, you know what? If you don't get in there 
at some level to block these criminals, they're going to rule over us. That's the rule. So stop going, oh, Alex, we're so blessed you're there. We can go about our business knowing you're fighting for us. Uh-uh. No, sir. That's why I've taken people that were hired for graphics and shoved them in here on air. Like Darren McBreen, he does a better job than I do half the time. You know, when he comes in here and does it. And, and the other half, he does as good a job as I do. Uh, John Bound does a great job. Uh, Aaron didn't want to do the nightly news. I saw talent in him. He is getting awesome. I mean, he is on fire. Uh, same thing with Rob Dew doing a great job. You know, again, you've got the talent to defend humanity. You've already got it in you. Your ancestors are incredible, no matter what color, creed, you know, religion. You're a human being. You are powerful. You're not junk. You're not crap. You're amazing. And remember that. And don't let a bunch of inbred globalists that are running things through a cancerous operation make you feel like you're crap. Human potential is unlimited. We're made in the image of the Creator. And I'll assure you, it's not the Creator they show you in Prometheus. <laughs> Oh, all right, I'm Alex Jones signing off. Until next time, remember, you're made in the image of the Creator. And uh, that's what they're trying to tell you. They're telling you the Creator doesn't like you. The devil doesn't like you. The Creator loves you because the Creator made you. And that's what they attack, the fact that we are stardust. We are in the universe. Everybody says, oh, I want to go to space someday. What, go up to orbit and get nauseated? You're in space on a giant planetoid with huge oceans and parrots flapping around. But what's the new world order want? Laser beams, day one. <laughs> slugs. Slugs. They can't operate machinery. All right, I'm quoting some time bandits. All right, Lord willing, pray for us. We'll see you back tomorrow night on the radio, 11 a.m. Central, 12 noon Eastern. Until then, I'm Alex Jones, the crazy, souped-up hillbilly from Austin, Texas, signing off.